Hi, and welcome to, um, actually this is a new series. Uh, Pam will not be uh, joining us anymore. I guess she's got a lot of work to do. And so uh, she's... She got busy. She got busy. And it's quite a bit of travel for her to get here from what I know. Yeah, she lives down in Dexter. And so uh, it's a lengthy drive. Plus, uh, this is the busy season for uh, her and her husband, the business that they have. And so they are, as they say, she is, as they say, bailing out. Uh, and she will be missed. I really enjoyed uh, working with her. She's a great person. That is person. the risk of volunteer positions, isn't it? It is. I wish we could issue paychecks, especially to myself. <laughs> but uh, Yeah, most especially. <laughs> yeah. So um, I guess you noticed that we had a little bit different opening. Uh, we are renaming the show Examining the Narrative. Uh, and I never really liked the idea of truth television. Uh, it seemed a little, uh, what's, the, what's the word there? A little pretentious, maybe. Pretentious, great word. Um, and, uh, but Pam liked it a lot, and so I, you know, I went along. Um, but the, we're going to change the focus a little bit. Um, I think we're, what, we're, what the whole intent, or at least my original intent, uh, things sort of changed a little bit when Pam got involved because she's been collecting news clips for years. Yeah. And, Really wanted she to. She changed the focus to more of a news review show. Exactly, which is very much like the program she used to do um, a few years back, um, and uh, very much like a la the Daily Show or any of these other programs that are well, out there. And so you know it was good, and we and we did it. But we're gonna, I think, go back to the concept that we had a little bit uh, earlier, which is, or at least when I originally started the thing which is looking at some of the things that people believe in the society and questioning whether those things are true. Yeah. So um, we'll, we'll sort of probably swing through this a few more times as we, as we go you know, forward. But um, the neocons, uh, the people you know, from the Bush administration like Paul Wolfowitz and Tom Ridge and um, uh, Donald Rumsfeld and that whole crew, uh, Dick Cheney, they basically were the students of, I believe it's Leo Strauss, I think Leo's his first name, who was a professor at the University of Chicago. Hmm. And one of the main things that he had, there's a great documentary called, um, uh, um, I'm drawing a blank on it, uh, it'll come to me. Um, and uh, The Power of Nightmares, that's what it's called. It's uh, three hours, and it originally played on the BBC. Hmm, and, I haven't heard of this one. And, um, uh, yeah, I got copies of it, I guess, I don't know, about 2004, maybe 2005 is when I stumbled across it. And um, it... Uh, it talks about the origins of the neocons and talks about Leo Strauss and, and his personality and what he believed. And what he taught basically was that uh, societies in order to function needed powerful myths. And it was the job of the leaders to manufacture those myths in order to order their society in the manner that they really wanted to, you know, things to go. And so, um, you know, you, you, you talk about things like the uh, rugged individual. Yeah. Okay. Um, for example, uh, Leo Strauss's favorite program or programs, uh, I guess, were Perry Mason and um, Gunsmoke. Okay. And so you get a, um, let's see. So let me, let me put myself a rule of thirds over here. Okay, so it looks right. Uh, I, have to, I actually have to lean back instead of... Uh, instead of leaning on the table. But uh, the whole thing that they, they talked about is if you want to, you know, rule a society, if you want to order a society, even, you know, something like the United States, you need yeah. powerful myths. So one of them is the myth of the rugged individualist. Then you move on to things like, you know, social Darwinism, Wild West capitalism, those kinds of things. And you feed those ideas into the society, largely, largely by packing, packaging them uh, the, the, the term we'll be looking at is framing, yeah. and then repeating them over and over and over and over and over until people come to believe that they're true. Yeah, you know, the Goebbels technique. Mm -hmm. 
it's, uh, you know, it's been propaganda since day one. Uh, it is part of the foundation of how people create and maintain religions. Yeah. And um, well, as I had someone say to me in a recent debate, what isn't propaganda? And that was in defense of the Quran. So mm -hmm. work that out. There's a lot of stuff <laughs> that is not propaganda. And, you know, the, the thing that we keep hitting on, you know, in the two television programs that we live shows we do is this concept of science. What does the yeah. evidence say? Are there experiments that yeah, you what's can provable? do? Uh, exactly. And provable oftentimes means repeatable. Yeah in the sense of um, if you do a physics experiment and you then write it up and, and, and publish it to the world, go through the peer review process and, and put your experiment out there, then anyone else can do that experiment. Yes, by using the steps that you are supposed to have laid out to explain how exactly you did your experiment, they should be able to reproduce it and get the same or very similar results. Right, and so what will happen is if there's an interesting result, lots of people will duplicate it, and that's usually something that gets handed off to graduate students. Yeah. In other words, some professor reads this and says, oh, that's kind of interesting, let's play with that. Yeah. Um, you know, most of the time when these kinds of results are, results are produced in high quality peer reviewed journals, the results will be uh, easily replicated. Yeah. However, there are cases where they're not. For example, uh, cold fusion. Yeah. Uh, the thing is that let's say that cold fusion was true, then um, that would have enormous economic value. So the people working on it, uh, Pons and Fleischmann, uh, as soon as they got what they thought looked like results, they instantly went out and published it. Yeah. And not only did they do that, but they went to the press and... <laughs> yeah, they and hyped them, they overhyped themselves. Precisely. And so immediately, um, you know, all over the country, you know, there were lots of people who were trying to duplicate their work. Yeah. Um, because it has huge, enormous, a huge economic value. Um, if it came out to be true, they, you know, they'd get Nobel Prizes and, you know, we're probably not talking about billionaires. We're talking probably hundred billionaires. We, well, yeah, we're, we're talking potentially the next oil magistrate levels of, of wealth. Precisely. I mean, you just leave Bill Gates behind. Yeah. That kind of stuff. Um, so, but it turned out not to not to pan out. Now, um, I can remember at the time that that all hit. I was um, in graduate school doing my MBA. And because, you know, people sort of knew that I had some science background, I had lots of people in the program go, is this true? You know, I said, well, it's I don't know. Say. It's hard to say. Uh, <clears throat> I can see, you know, I can see the potential. It, it strikes me as though maybe not, but maybe you could, you know, get a crystal um, to hold, you know, two hydrogen atoms and, you know, and vibrate the thing and click them together. Could you at a low, you know, at, in, in small sites actually get that? And then could you sustain it? Because as soon as that happened, you'd release a lot of energy to yeah. sort of crater the crystal. Um, but, you know, if they got results like that, then it's definitely worth looking at. Um, so it was kind of like, I don't know, you know, I, I'd love to see it work, but uh, yeah. let's wait and yeah, see. Yeah, you weren't willing to give definitive answers yet. Precisely. Let's wait and see what the next... Uh, group of these things um, uh, produces. So, you know, that's a piece of a narrative. Yeah. You know, in other words, people put together a story, and, and even, you know, describing your experiment is a story. Yeah. And so, so the question is, does that narrative work? Now, so we're going we're gonna to start looking at how you develop a sacred myth. Um, in other words, it's the foundation to religion. Um, it's been studied, you know, because now you look at how religions um, are formulated and become successful, and again, those that fail, how their sacred myth uh, comes into conflict with what people know, yeah. and, and they fade out yeah. and it's replaced a by something else. As the else. sacred myths uh, pegs are taken out from under it by observable reality, they tend to struggle. Exactly. So. Um, We've got that kind of thing. Now, advertising is about building sacred myths in the sense that if you can create brand loyalty, there's a set of techniques to do Which that. Which is pretty bizarre. Just the concept of brand loyalty in itself is pretty bizarre. No, when you, well, 
when you walk down, say, the detergent aisle, and you, you, know, you could stop and read every bottle, mm -hmm. but then again, do you trust the people with the bottles? No, and you could actually walk in with your experiment kit and you know, your set and of stains and stuff. your you know, water buckets and everything, you just haul it in and pour a little bit here, pour a little bit here, test it in the aisle. Yeah. I mean, the store owner probably wouldn't be very happy. No, probably not. But you could do that. And, and the problem is that if you did that kind of thing with every decision that you made about life, you wouldn't be able to move forward. You'd, run out, you'd completely run out of time. So you have to um, make a decision that it's good enough. Okay? And for some people, it's cheer. And other people, it's tied. Yeah. Other be, you know, it's arm almost and hammer. Almost arbitrarily at this point, because <laughs> they're almost all the same. Exactly. And so you, know, you get to a point where things are a commodity, and so brand loyalty doesn't really do much for you. Yeah. But the question is, how do you manufacture and maintain these kinds of brand loyalty sacred myths? So let's bring up the first slide. Um, there, are Bruce. <laughs> So, yeah, Bruce is switching the show for the first time. Um, Perfect. Oh, yeah, I guess we, we forgot. Let's do the presidential primaries and we'll oh. move back into this, the sacred myth thing. Oh, fantastic. So last night uh, was uh, six primaries. Um, and at this point, it looks like Trump has done it. He now has more delegates than he needs. So he will become yeah. the nominee on the first vote. That was pretty much inevitable. Yeah, that was a done deal a couple months ago. Um, Hillary Clinton now has her, her delegates. Uh, Bernie Sanders fell a little bit short. Uh, there's nowhere near enough delegates anymore for him to make up the deficit. Um, and we will talk some more about that later on because it does come down, you know, again, what do people believe about the candidates? Why do they believe it? And what are the myths that are, are created around the candidates? So we will look at that some more. Now, um, so those are the stuff at the bottom of the screen is the percentages, um, you know, with uh, Hillary first and Bernie second. Um, so Bernie, I think, won two and Hillary won four. Um, yeah. But uh, it seems as population goes up, Bernie's appeal goes down because he won, what, North Dakota and Montana? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but California was pretty heavily contested. And... Um, so, you know, it's, the, the question is, I wrote an editorial for the Register Guard back, I believe, in early July. And I, I'm sort of planning to put another one together and hopefully they'll, they'll publish it. Looking at how this came about. But that's the result, so it looks like it's going to be the uh, Hillary and Donald show. Unfortunately, I don't think Hillary can win, which is troubling. Yeah. And there's a lot of people um, who, after spending some time looking at her, um, won't vote for her. Well, in the polls that I've seen that put her ahead yeah. of Donald Trump, put a, I think there's an 18% down there that says they haven't decided between the two. Yeah. So those are the ones that put her ahead. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the ones that have a huge undecided population, which is no more comforting. Yeah. So things aren't quite over. Um, we have the two conventions coming up in July, the Republican and then the Democratic convention. And there's still a lot of, a lot of distance between here and there um, because it is possible that an indictment will come down on, uh, on Hillary, and that's probably going to uh, change the situation. Yeah, you'd imagine. So um, we'll have to see. But even if it doesn't happen, um, I, I think Trump is going to mangle her. Which well, is, unfortunately, it just fits the pendulum theory. Yeah. I mean, truth be told, we had four years of this president, four years of a Democratic president, four years of a, or eight years of a Republican president, eight years of a Democratic president. It's just how it's gone. Yeah. Since I've been following politics in my entire lifetime, all I've seen is it sway back and forth between eight years of each type of president. Mm -hmm. And this is the Republicans' turn now. That's just how the country works. I don't know how. So, um, but let's move, let's move on. So we'll be talking more about that as, as things go along. But let's put up the second slide. Okay, and there's our sacred myth, which, uh, diagram for that, which was on the op opening of the show, because we are gonna be talking about uh, sacred myths and what are the components of sacred myths 
as we move uh, from topic to topic and begin to look at um, the belief structures associated with those topics. Now the way this thing works um, is each one of those uh, lettered uh, circles represents a meme and a meme is an idea and so um, for example in say the libertarian view that's fairly co uh, common you can start um, with the government can't do anything right yeah okay um, you know the marketplace uh, will give you the best result uh, things like that it's a series of beliefs about it um, and on closer examination, almost none of them will hold up because we can see examples of things that the government actually did right. And we can see examples of things that the marketplace didn't do so yeah. good at, that there were uh, what one would call market failures. But the way the thing works, um, and since we've been talking the last few weeks about 9-11, um, let's, let's, take, let's take that as a simple example. Now, uh, one of the things I used to do was carry around a bunch of uh, photographs that I'd printed out on um, 11 by 17 paper of um, the hole, the entry hole at the Pentagon, which was one of the first things that I came across and began to look at. And so I you know, went hunting for pictures, pulled them down off the Department of Defense website. Uh, they had taken a whole lot of photographs. And so one of the things when I talk to people about this thing is I would pull out of my backpack my, my photographs and say, here's the pictures. And they, you know, they'd be saying, oh, no, it can't be like this. And then they look at the pictures and go, uh, there's a problem here, isn't there? And I'd say, yeah, there is. And let's put the diagram back up. And we'll, we'll consider the photographs to be item number G. So what I've now done is there's a... Part of the whole 9-11 narrative is the story about the Pentagon. So what I've now done is, is defeated the story, or at least a part of that story, um, that meme about the Pentagon. I've showed that the hole is too small for an airplane to go through. And so people, you know, they've had their sacred myth that's been manufactured, constructed, put in their head, interfered with. So what will happen is you can sort of see the gears turning in their head and, and it's like, oh my God, you know, maybe I have to consider this. And then what will happen is they'll say, well, where do the planes go? And yeah. what about the cell phone calls? And, you know, the government can't, you know, I mean, it, they can't keep a secret. So there need to be too many people involved in this. And, you know, it just goes on and on. And what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And what's happening is all those little other memes that have been installed around um, the arena sort of gang up to defend G, yeah. which is the story about the Pentagon. It's essentially an intellectual gish gush. Mm hmm and so all of them just pop out, and of course they're going, well, you haven't answered this, and you need to answer this. And I'm saying, oh, time out, one at a time. Let's yeah. take these things one at a time. As you've talked, I've made a list. You've now given me 11 but points. But nobody's prepared for that. And so I'm, I'm there with my list, and I say, let's go through these one at a time. <laughs> okay? And they, no, I'm not going to do that. And, and, well, I said, you know, so I would say, you've just seen some evidence indicating there's a problem with the official story. Mm -hmm. Okay? And they say, well, I didn't see anything. I said, oh, wait a second. You just looked at these pictures. No, I didn't. They're right here. Let's look at them again. I'm not going to look at those pictures. And, um, you know, it's like... It's very similar to how you would imagine uh, old, uh, old Christians would react to things they considered satanic. Well, they'll be like, oh, nope, don't, I can't even look at it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to hear about it. Just they'll plug their ears and do Hail Marys and run away. I mean, and, and you know, more than half the time, what will happen is after this little exchange where they insist, well, you haven't done this and you haven't done this, and obviously the, the story is true, you know, it's because they don't, want to, they don't want to go through the problem of looking at all of their evidence and questioning their beliefs. Yeah. Um, they'll actually come back and assert, well, the hole at the Pentagon is, is the correct size for the plane. And, you know, even after they saw photographic evidence that no, it wasn't. Yeah. Okay. So they'll reassert it. The sacred myth is back in place. Okay. Now, the game is that you can defeat all of those little circles one by one. But you can't, um, 
you know, but the thing will reform because all the other ones will protect the ones that are injured. Yeah, well, and, and there's an issue of uh, resistance. Mm -hmm. And there's an increase of resistance with every single leg you pull out from under this. People resist further and further to the point where they just prefer to retreat most of the time. Most of the time, they will reject continued conversation and just leave. Yep. They'd much prefer that over ha having this challenged. Mm -hmm. That's how most people are. Yeah. So, okay, so let's, uh, so we've talked about that a little bit. What, I'm gonna, what we're going to do now is we're going to do an example. You know, I've, I've given sort of an intro based on some of the 9-11 stuff. But let's just do another example. So this little item um, touching the, the tire, okay, on a bicycle is called a tire saver. And what it does is as your wheel comes around, it rides on the wheel, and if there's any glass or, you know, pieces of wire or nails stones. Or, or anything that could, you know, puncture the tire that sticks into it, it takes several trips around before it will be pushed through the tire. And so coming around, what it does is it flicks it off, okay? And so I came across this concept uh, back in 1981. I took my first trip to Europe. And while I was there, I was talking to some people about uh, the fact that I did a lot of bicycling around. We were, I was in London and uh, got into a conversation. And I'd been biking a lot in the Boston area. I'd, I would, instead of taking the car, I would take the bike and, and, and do that. And I was getting about a flat a week because there's just enormous amounts of broken glass in the Boston area. Shocking. And uh, so, you know, I always brought a couple of tubes with me and my pump and all that. And at least once a week, I'd be sitting by the side of the road uh, repairing a flat, taking the, tire, the wheel off and taking the tire out and fixing the flat. Um, so what they did was they said, oh, that's not a problem. What you do is you take an old spoke and you bend it around the frame, okay? So it, it stays, and then you just loop it over the top of the tire, and it rattled a whole lot, but it stopped the, the tire problem. Something akin to what we're seeing there. What's that? Something akin to what you're seeing there. Exactly, there's you know, a number of different designs, but the, but the object is to get it to flick the stuff off before it pushes through the tread surface. So let's go to the next uh, slide. Well, I discovered um, you know, so these things kind of weren't very popular, but then they started to appear in um, bike shops around the United States. And they were around for a couple of years, and then they just kind of vanished. And they just kind of trickled away. Yep. And so the question was, why did they trickle away? And in having a conversation with a couple of bike shop owners, they said, oh yeah, well, what happened was when they started to become popular, this um, uh, pamphlet was circulated around the bike shops. And um, the reasons that we have here are the ones that you, for the sacred myth, that you will tell your customers. And, but the ones that were told to the bike shops is, if you sell these things, you won't, you won't fix as many tires, yeah. and you won't sell as many tires, and you won't sell as many tubes. So maybe you want these things to go away. And around that time is when uh, bicycle tread on bicycle tires went from being um, kind of smooth, slicks, not a lot of tread, um, to um, very aggressive. Yeah. And what it would do is, of course, the, the knobbly tires would uh, interfere with, um, you know, pull the tire saver off and damage the tire saver. So was it a conspiracy? You tell me. Okay. Now, I have that stuff talking to the bike shop owners secondhand. I have a couple of them who told me, yeah, we got this notice and, and so, so these are the pieces for the sacred myth and how to construct it. Yeah. And so... But I found, the reason I bring this up is because I had an interesting experience. Uh, three years ago when I turned 60, I decided to bike down the Pacific Coast. And um, I got about halfway and I wore out one of the tires. I mean, you know, it's not adding yeah, another, thousand, another thousand miles with a, you know, heavy panniers on the bike. And the rear tire wore out. So I had one uh, folded up in the uh, panniers and I replaced it and then I needed to find another tire that didn't have tread on it. So I started going to bike shops. I, you know, I'd go through a town and I'd see a bike shop and I'd stop and ask them if they had any slicks. And they'd say, no, 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 I don't have any slicks. And so um, 
I say, well, what I really want is something that I can use tire savers with. And they say, and so let's bring up that last slide again. And so they'd say, well, tire savers don't work. And I go, what do you mean they don't work? Yeah. I went from having a flat every week on average to not having a flat tire for 35 years. Excuse me, they do work. Okay, and they say, well, they're really noisy, and I say, well, you know, yeah, you notice, you know, you sort of tune them out after a while. They are a little noisy, but they're not bad, and I would much prefer that noise to the sound of a tire popping. Yeah. Okay, and they say, well, they cause a lot of drag, and I say, well, you know, since I've been using them, I've probably biked 25, 30,000 miles, and it just never struck me that it was, you know, that much more difficult to to ride. And I say, yeah, but they wear your tires out. And I say, I don't see any evidence that they wear out yeah. faster. And they certainly, you know, I don't have to replace as many tubes. And I don't have uh, blowouts now. Yeah, because so the, that's an interesting way to think of it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, then they go, well, um, the newer tires don't really need this stuff because they're all improved and they have Kevlar in there and extra, extra stuff. And I'd say, well, you know, I did when I, when I got my newer bike, um, the tires that, that were on it uh, wouldn't allow, because of the, the roughness of the tread, wouldn't yeah. allow the tire savers. The first tire went at six weeks, and the second tire went at eight. So it's like after that, I put... That's pretty quick. I put slicks on them. You know, and I'm in Eugene, and there's not that much glass there's on the really roads. There's really not. I mean, this is a good place to be biking. And um, so as soon as the two tires, or when they went, I immediately put on something with a slick and added the tire saver. So yeah. I, and since then, I have not had a flat. Uh, you know, I've had pinch flats where I hit, say, a curb or, you know, a, a discontinuity in the sidewalk yeah. as you're going. That kind of thing will pinch the sidewalls, and you do get, you know, sidewall damage. Yeah. But the tire savers aren't designed to help you pass no, that And one. I don't know anything that is. There's not a whole lot that'll take the, uh, the, the abuse you need a tire to take and simultaneously not go flat. It'd just be like riding on the old wood rims. You may yeah. as well just go back to wood rim tires at that point. Mm -hmm. They never go flat. They don't. Or, or solid rubber. Yeah. But uh, let's, let's put it back up there, Bruce. And so, you know, the thing is that the newer tires do fail, okay? And then they say, well, yeah, but they cause all kinds of problems with your components because they spray water on you and the components and all this grit gets into them. It's like, excuse me, that's not true either. And it just goes on and on. In other words, there's a whole series of these things. And what happened was I got this one guy, I don't remember exactly what time, I think it was around Eureka in California. Oh yeah, that, lovely area. That um, um, I stopped in to see if they had any tires and, and this guy was just getting angry at me because I wasn't buying his objection, um, you know. Downright ornery about it. He was, and it's like, dude, you know, this is my money and if you don't improve your attitude, yeah. I'm gonna take wait, my money wait, elsewhere. Like, wait, let me get this straight. <laughs> I wanna give you money and you're trying to talk me out of it. I find that interesting. So, um, but you know, you can watch these things come in. Uh, so why, why this example? Because for most people, it doesn't really, you yeah. know, have much of an emotional impact. You talk about 9-11, you talk about some of the other things that yeah, we're you planning. You talk about religions, you talk about political points of views, you talk about ideolo ideological perspectives. People get little knee-jerk reactions. You got it. You talk about why the memes of libertarianism are fundamentally broken. People tend to get offended. Yeah. I mean, I like a lot of the concepts of libertarianism. Yeah. You know, I think, I, I think it's fundamentally right. But the thing is that you have to go through and say, okay, well, which ones of these are really true and which ones aren't? And because if you're, if you're making your decisions based on things which are not in accord with reality, you're not going to make good decisions. I mean, that's just, that's just the nature of the beast. And so, um, that, uh, so that's the nature of a, of a sacred myth. And we're going to uh, we're going to move on uh, from there. So let's put the next slide up. Okay, now last week we had a caller call in uh, who talked about some, a man, a uh, window washer, uh, who fell from a 47-story building and survived. And, you know, I started to say to her, um, well, you know, there's probably some uh, circumstances that, that you know, mitigated the fall, broke the fall. And she's, no, 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 he survived and that's it and it's a miracle. Okay, so I did the research. 
Um, this guy actually, it was in 2007 in New York City, and there were a series of articles that the New York Times wrote uh, relating to this, uh, because somebody surviving a 47, you know, story fall is um, newsworthy because it doesn't happen very often. Yeah, it's at least interesting to read, which is more than you can say about half of the things otherwise on the New York Times. Absolutely. So. The looking through, you know, the articles, I read a whole bunch of articles this week on this, and um, generally in medical circles, it's agreed that four to five floors is about where you get 50% death. It's the LD50. Yep. So in other words, um, if you fall less than, than four or five floors, in other words, if you fall a foot, you're not going to die. Yeah. Okay. So there's this inverse relationship um, with the, you know, in other words, your survival rate, um, is inversely proportional to the to the height of the fall. So 40 to 50 feet, half of the people die. If you have a head injury at three floors, um, that's a 50 percent uh, yeah. death rate. Okay. Yeah, which means you have to somehow fall four or five floors without hitting your head. Exactly. Which is highly unlikely. Mm -hmm. So um, now the thing is that that the highest that the highest thing I found was somebody a parachutist who fell 22,000 feet, he had a parachute failure, mm -hmm. and he survived it. And the reason he survived, there were two items. Number one, he was able to find a, a puddle of water, <laughs> a pool of water, and land in the pool of water. Well, and a parachute failure isn't inherently a parachute 100% parachute failure. It's a, a partial opening. <coughs> exactly. In other words, the thing came out and knotted up. Yeah. But it did slow his fall. So the combination of um, uh, the combination of a partially useful parachute and falling into water did it for him. Yeah. Now most people agree that a hundred foot fall into water will kill you, um, and that's basically ten stories. Yeah. So if you land in water, if you land on concrete, <laughs> four to five floors is fifty percent. Um, 100 feet is pretty much lethal um, if you fall in water, or, uh, in water. And the reason is because you have terminal velocity. Now for a person falling, terminal velocity is the point where the air resistance um, exactly balances the gravitational acceleration and so you don't go any faster. And for a human being falling, it's about 120 miles an hour and if you hit um, at that, it's generally about, it's generally 100% fatal. Uh, when you bullet into the earth. Exactly. So, the guy on the 47 floors, the reason, there were two people, um, a window washer and his brother. What happened to the window washer who survived is he was able to hold on to the scaffolding. And so he kind of rode it down like a surfboard, so it slowed his uh, descent. And that's, if you're doing this kind of thing, that's what they tell you to do. If the thing fails, grab the floor as, as quickly as you can and hold it's on to it. It's falling slower than terminal velocity. It is falling much slower than terminal velocity. So that's the thing that made it possible for him to survive, because he, you know, basically dropped the, the floor was probably bringing him down at about the rate if he was going four to five floors. So he was in the 50% that, that survived. Yeah. But he rode it down like a surfboard. And I think his brother didn't. And his brother didn't. He wasn't able to hold on. He just fell 47 floors right onto the concrete. Done. Okay. So the issue is, can you, you know, do something to get you below uh, terminal velocity or well below terminal velocity and if you have some kind of a mitigating circumstance then it's not a miracle so and and to sit there and to insist when someone says wait a second I'm having problem with this you know claim that you're making there must be some mitigating circumstance to um, double down is the, the sign that you're believing in something that you just simply don't want not to be true. Exactly. You've or entered that, into the realm of necessitating it. Or that you do not have the information that you need to complete the discussion. Yes. So the better thing to do is to say, wow, you know, this was really interesting. Um, maybe I should get some more information and, and complete the discussion so that I understand it a little bit better. Because physics doesn't lie. No. That's the point. No, unfortunately. So that's the 47 stories. Now, um, 
Another thing that happened this week um, was that we had a, a comment on one of the videos, so I pulled this thing out. Ooh, goody. And um, basically, this was about the 9-11. I, I, it's not entirely certain to me what it's about, but I think it's the 9-11 stuff. And basically, w what he says is, you know, that my logic is, you know, he starts out, oh, please. And I said, well, could you be more specific? And he said, no, I'm not going to be more specific. Um, look up fallacy and uh, argument from ignorance, and you should know that you're not supposed to do that. Okay? And so after he refused to go any further, I just told him I wasn't interested in talking to him anymore. Well, yeah, if they're not going to specify, what's the point? Yeah, so no more feeding the trolls. No, that was, that was, uh, that was probably someone who basically would just prefer we not have these discussions at all about anything. Right. That's, that's, what, that I've, uh, that's a real big pattern on, on, on the Internet is people that find a, a someone taking a position and just say taking a position on this is wrong. Mm -hmm. Just period, ever taking a position on this is wrong because taking a position means you are opening yourself to a counter position, which means you could be wrong. Uh -huh. So it's better to sit as the third party and say, these people are wrong and these people are wrong, and I'm ultimately right by taking no position. The people who I subscribe to on the Internet, generally the thing that makes me decide that I'm going to click the subscribe button is that somebody has challenged them on something that they've said, and they said, oh, as a result of this comment, I went and looked at some more stuff, found out that I was wrong, and now this seems to be a more correct position to take. Yeah. When I see someone do that, that means there's probably somebody that I'm, I'm willing to listen to. And, uh, you know, and, and YouTubers make faux pas all the time. But if they're willing to admit them to them and willing to correct them, um, then you probably have somebody that's worth following. So, um, but let's go back to, since we have a claim that we're making, um, you know, that we're arguing from ignorance, let's review the argument over the last two weeks. Okay, so if you can kick up the next one. So the first thing that we do, did was showed about 30 photographs um, that indicate that there was huge amounts of dust on 9-11. And that dust carried for a great distance, which means that it had to be fairly fine. And so using the example of picking up a handful of sand and tossing it in the air, um, how fine does it have to be for that kind of dust to blow away versus um, the stuff that just falls to the ground almost immediately? Okay, and the answer is it's probably sub 100 micron, probably even 100 microns is uh, 100 millionths of a meter. Okay, so um, the second group of photographs uh, indicated that there um, were no chunks of concrete, okay, only dust and metal at ground zero. Um, no piles of floors. So in other words, pretty much all of the roughly 120 tons of concrete in each of the two towers had been pulverized. Yes. Okay. So from there, we calculated the amount of energy in the buildings themselves that would bring the buildings down. And that was the only source available to pulverize the, um, the concrete. Um, fires would have no effect or very little effect on it. Um, the original fuel from the airplane, the impact of the airplane had no effect. So it's only the gravitational potential energy that would be available under the official story to um, uh, create or to pulverize the dust. And then we calculated how much energy it would take to pulverize to uh, one millimeter, which is uh, if, if the most of the dust is sub 10 microns, or sub 100 microns rather, then one millimeter is much bigger than that. And so we know that um, the, the energy to pulverize is actually a low estimate. And, we, and given the assumptions that we made, uh, we could pretty much assure that the gravitational potential energy was a high estimate. So then, let's pop the next slide up. So we have those two numbers. Um, so this 564,000 kilowatt hours plus uh, is a problem because it's greater than the available energy, which is the 257 uh, for gravitational potential energy, which is high, which means the number probably is less than that. 
So once we have that, we know that there's a problem with the official story. So we then make a hypothesis of explosives. And based on that hypothesis, we go searching for additional evidence. Okay? And so piece number one is that there's dust samples, and they contain slag balls and uh, un unexploded nanothermite. And we have good, solid evidence for that. Evidence number two is the temperature of the pile. And the physics is that you start out with gravitational potential energy, and as the building falls, it converts to heat and um, uh, kinetic energy, the energy of motion. Yeah. But that the total amount, in other words, you start out with X amount of energy, and as it falls, you still have X amount of energy. And when it hits the ground and converts all to heat, when the rumbling and the sound and, and all the rest subside, what you have is things that are warmer than they were before. And so the issue is how much heat was released, and the temperature of the pile is way too hot, even for um, burning all the materials in the building and the, the jet fuel and the falling, it's still way too hot. Okay? Significantly so. So, again, uh, we can look at, now we start to look at the nanothermite and we start to look at uh, the nanothermite residue and the slag balls and we find huge amounts of barium in it, which is physically unlikely. So that so means... a fairly rare mineral. That means that somebody manufactured this, and there was there a reason for the barium? And the answer to that is, yeah, it causes the stuff to react faster, which means it explodes better. So we're going to add two more pieces of evidence to this uh, tonight, just to add a little bit of strength to our hypothesis. Okay? And the first is that even after dousing the pile with water continuously for six weeks, they still pulled molten metal out of the pile. And uh, there's going to be a picture of some metal, molten metal dripping out of the side of the building, uh, which is problematic uh, in itself. And, uh, we're all, and there's a beam, there's beams that were cut at an angle, which is what you would do if you were demolishing a building. And those beams were cut um, on, you know, when the photographs were taken later in the day, 9-11, 9-12, before any of the cleanup had occurred, these photographs were taken. So the question is, how did the beams get cut in an angle? So let's go to the next slide. So that's firemen opening up the pile. Uh, and we have these photographs because there was a, a court case between FEMA that came in to take over the site and the, and the firemen who had jurisdiction over this um, uh, disaster site. In other words, part of their, their whole thing is to clean the thing up. Okay, so we have um, that, um, we have molten metal coming out. There's the firemen pulling some stuff out and finding molten metal. Let's take the next one. Okay, again, more molten metal as they start to pull the pile apart. Okay, next one. Okay, there they're lifting molten metal. <laughs> this particular, I know that this particular um, uh, frame is a still out of a movie that was taken six weeks after, while they, they, had, they had doused the pile with water for six weeks. So the question is where, how much energy was necessary that the pile still had molten metal in it six weeks after uh, the event? Okay, let's try the next one. This is that uh, uh, metal. Um, what appears to be a thermite reaction. We have the yellow hot molten iron flowing out of the building and off to the right there's a wisp of this whitish cloud stuff. Now the video, um, this is a single frame taken out of a video or there's actually several videos of this uh, particular event but taken out of the video and if if you play back up a few frames that cloud of uh, what looks, you could say, well, that's just smoke, wasn't there. But, now, but then the, the metal starts to come out, and you begin to see this cloud of white dust coming out, and that's the aluminum oxide. Because in the thermite reaction, the iron moves from the rust. Thermite is powdered rust, which is iron oxide, and powdered aluminum. And the iron or the 
oxygen moves from the rust, the iron oxide, to the aluminum oxide, and that blows away as this powdered dust. Okay, so we see another, more examples of thermite uh, in action. And now we see this next, build, this next one, which is one of the beams that has been cut at an angle. Okay, and that's usually done with what's called shape charges um, that are attached to the beam at an angle so that the part of the beam above it will slide off and the building will, you know, collapse. And on its own footprint. Precisely. It's part of a controlled demolition. It's normal operating, uh, stu uh, operating procedures for controlled demolition. And had FEMA taken this over, we would not have any of these photographs. But we do have them because the firemen won. And so we have lots of these kinds of photographs. Now, you know, I've only showed you a few photographs in total, maybe about uh, 40. Um, but these are just, you know, a few of the photographs out of literally hundreds, if not thousands of photographs that show these same kinds of fossil remains in this thing, which brings up um, which brings up. So let's hit the next slide, or that may be the last one. Oh yeah. Um, so, so the issue is that, that there's lots of evidence indicating that there's a problem with the official story. Um, now, in 2000, in March of 2005, um, Popular Mechanics published an article saying you know, the 9-11 conspiracy stuff is all a bunch of nonsense and whatever. It was a terrible artic article. But the thing is that if you, if you had not studied any of the 9-11 stuff beforehand, you would read the article and go, yeah, 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 they're probably right. These people are all tin hat nutballs. Um, but if you had done some of this reading, um, you know, and looking into it and looking at some of the pictures, um, you would come away saying, that's not true, that's not true, that's not true, that's not true, that's not true. However, that article was then um, uh, pub or expanded into a book which was published in August of 2006. Now, the thing about this book is when it came out, I immediately got a copy and read the thing and it was just cringeworthy. But it makes a case um, for people who haven't studied this at all. They'll, they'll buy it, just like the 9-11 Commission Report does the same well, thing. Well, come on. It's got a forward by John McCain. It's got to be good. And it's published by Popular Mechanics. Yeah, it's got to be is, good. Which is a Hearst publication. Okay. So let's, let's take a look. And that's, uh, you know, here I have my copy of this book. Um, you know, let's come back to us. I'm waving here. <laughs> Bruce, here, oh, no, not the next slide. Uh, there we go. So here's, here's, here's my copy of the book. Now, in the book, you know, th there's a lot of things. We could go page by page and say, you know, this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem. And, um, but we can go, to, you know, for a, an example, we can go to the pictures, okay? The first picture is just a shot of the fireball on the plane, the second plane hitting. And then the next picture, which has some significance, is they're talking about um, the airplanes. There's a, we'll talk about that in a second because we had a couple more slides coming up. So let's bring the slides up. But this is um, the next one. Yeah, this is a scan of the picture out of the book. And what they're doing is the picture on the left is the only high-resolution photograph that I am aware exists of the second plane just before it hits the tower. Um, all the other photographs were taken, or all the other pictures were taken with video, which is low um, resolution. So when you look at it, you can sort of see that there seems to be something attached to the bottom of the plane, a cylindrical device. Now, popular mechanics says, oh, no, 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 that's just a, the sunlight reflecting off the plane, and they give us this alternative picture. Now, you notice that the one on the left is in black and white, and it's kind of grainy, because it's sort of blown up. The one on the right is in color, very high resolution. So, um, let's go to the next slide. So, if what we do is we scale them so that they are... Um, so that the second photograph is now in black and white, 
and we scale it so that the, the diameter of the fuselage is the same, and we blur it a little bit, okay, you can just use a blur filter. Um, there's other filters that will add grain, but, you know, blur filter is good enough. Now what you notice is a couple of things. Uh, first of all, that fairing, you know, the, the bright spot on the fairing on the right-hand picture doesn't really match the shape of, the, of the, that thing that seems to be attached to the bottom of the plane. Okay, so their argument that it's just a trick of light, you know, if you compare the two, it just doesn't match because you see that light, not only is it at the fairing, the piece that sticks out underneath the wing, but it's also on the fuselage, and yet you don't see it on the picture on the left along the fuselage. So you got a problem there. <coughs> It's also, if you notice, that the fairing is not the same length as the fairing on the original or plane. Or in the same position. And you notice that the sweep of the wing and the width of the wing is not the same on the right-hand um, uh, picture and the left-hand picture. In other words, these are not the same kind of airplane. No. So what popular mechanics did was they gave you a comparison of apples to oranges and, and sort of you know, said, waved their hands and said, yeah, this is true, and don't, you know, ignore that man behind the curtain. Well, it should be fairly apparent just to the casual observer those aren't the same play. Right, but when you're, when you're reading along through a book and they're telling you that this has been debunked by our group of experts, okay, in other words, I can, I can actually read this little uh, section at the beginning, okay, um, and they describe it as one, light trick. Some photos of American Airlines Flight 175 above left appear to show a bulge on the fuselage at the base of the Boeing 767's right wing. Some theorists speculate that this could be a military pod or missile. Experts, this is their experts, say the photo is distorted by sunlight and the bulge is in fact the plane's right fairing, which holds the landing gear as seen in the photograph of an identical Boeing 767 above right. Is this actually a photograph of a 767? The width of the wing is different. It's clearly identical. The, the flare, the angle at which the wing is um, shown is, is different. The um, length of the fairing is different. And they're telling us that these are the same planes. Excuse me, which experts are these? Um, the best. The entire book is like that. So, okay, let's see, do we have another slide or is that it? I guess that's it. So, so the person who made the comment that said that we're arguing from ignorance, are we really arguing from ignorance? Yeah, well, insofar as we don't have an alternative proposal that, you know, we can guarantee. Right. I mean, does that, does that qualify us for arguing from ignorance? I don't think so. I don't think so either. What we're really asking for is, is another investigation that is not controlled by the people who are implicated in the, invest, in, implicated in the crime. Imagine that. You know, so there seems to be some fairly substantial evidence indicating that, that the high level operatives within the Bush administration were part of this whole, you know, whole thing. Uh, we have an ironclad argument that says there's a physical problem with the official story. How do we get account for the energy to pulverize the dust? So we start moving through the, re the other pieces of evidence to assemble hypothesis, which is that exp explosives were used. Okay, we had a phone call, so let's take that. Hi, uh, you're on this show. What's your name? Hello? Okay, I'm not, not hearing anyone. If, you, if you're listening on your TV, turn it down because there's a 10-second delay. I'm trying to. The dumb, dumb remote <laughs> don't want to work half the time. Oh, hey there, John. What's up? Well, you know, two, two things. Uh, I, something I mentioned before, but you were talking about the, uh, uh, the thing from ignorance. And uh, I, I thought, yeah, you're, you're talking from ignorance, about as far away from ignorance as somebody can get. And uh, so yeah, that's kind of a play on words, but uh, yeah. you're, you're, I mean, everything makes sense. In that airplane picture, 
I don't even know how a six-year-old could miss the fact that, that those are not the two same planes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Because like you say, the sweep of the wing, the distance to the engine, and uh, the whole configuration is just totally wrong. Yep. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, there, there could be, you know, uh, something in there that uh, we simply don't understand yet. Yeah, could there's a lot we don't understand. And the last thing I wanted to say is, was that, uh, and I mentioned this in a previous program, is the way the dust traveled out is not at all surprising when you consider there was tens of thousands of cubic feet of air in each one of them floors, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. which collapsed at a very rapid rate, and that air just went out in all directions, probably close to a cyclone force. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I, you know... Again, we get, to, we get to the question of, is it sufficient to overcome, is the overpressure sufficient to account for, for what we saw? The answer is probably not. Because again, you're limited by the total amount of energy available in the, gravi- in the, in, in the vertical position of the materials in the building, the gravitational potential energy. But let, let me just summarize this thing with popular mechanics. Now, when the popular mechanics book came out, um, I would, you know, continue to talk to people about this whole thing. And what I found was that people who had been sort of a little bit receptive, but, you know, maybe kind of saying, I need more, I need more evidence, immediately came back and said, well, popular mechanics came out, and they, they say this is all garbage. Yeah. And so, you know... When I, your authority is popular mechanics, there's a problem. Exactly. And so um, another example is, for example, Skeptics Magazine, which in the same month, August published its, its thing, and I think Michael Shermer should know better than that, because um, I actually know the, I actually met Michael Shermer some years ago. Um, but what happened is that during August, there was a huge push to kind of debunk the, you know, the 9-11, we'll call it conspiracy stuff, uh, tr- 9-11 truth stuff is what people used to like to call it. Um, but what happened is after a couple, I talked to a couple people about the book, I actually asked the next one and said, well, have you actually read it? And they said, no. And I said, oh, okay. So what you're telling me is the mere existence of this book, yes. unread by you, is sufficient for you to turn off your brain and not think. How's that new to you? Christians have been doing that for hundreds of years. Exactly. It's the same thing. Yeah. Well, you got me thinking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we got about another 20 seconds. Got any closing thoughts? No, nothing now. We'll okay. talk to you next week. Okay. See you, see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. So, yeah, I think what we're going to do with this show, I mean, we started by finishing up a little bit of stuff from before, but we're going to look at narratives and what's the evidence for and against. So we will see you guys next week.